Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul this morning, where we are going to continue with our worship series entitled Foundation on Building an Identity on God's Word. And today we're going to focus a little bit more narrowly on God's Word as a refuge from our sufferings. And we'll see that in our readings and from the message from the pulpit this morning. Welcome to all of our visitors who are with us this day. It's a joy to have you here with us in God's house at St. Paul's. And if you have any questions about the service, please see one of our ushers. Everything is printed for you except for the hymns. It should be very easy for you to follow along. And please take a moment to introduce yourself to me on your way out today. We're going to take a few moments of silence before we join together in praying the prayer upon entering church. That can be found at the bottom of page one. But first, a few moments of silence. We pray, Heavenly Father, this world can feel like a storm, and at times I feel like I've lost my way, like I have no control. Through your word, comfort me and give me the peace that only you can give. Assure me that you are with me through the stormiest times in my life. Let your word be a refuge to me. Amen. We'll open our service this morning with the singing of hymn 221, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. That can be found in the red hymnal. And may God richly bless your worship of our Savior Jesus this day. I invite the congregation to rise. I will sing the first three bars of this introduction and the congregation will follow. We make our beginning this morning 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and we deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will.
Let us pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for this day is taken from the Old Testament book of Proverbs. And here, Solomon, the wisest man in the history of the world, urges you to take refuge in God's word. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you now to take a hold of your red hymnal and turn to page number 84 so that we can join together in singing Psalm 46. Our second lesson is from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. And here Paul finds comfort in the midst of his trials from Christ's words to him through the angel. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor <clears throat> and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. 
When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Syrtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Following the reading of the verse of the day, we'll join together in singing our alleluias as they're printed for you in your service folder on page 5. Alleluia. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Alleluia. Would you please stand for the reading of our Lord's Gospel? From Mark chapter 4. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. This is the gospel of our Lord. The congregation may be seated. We'll join together now in singing from our red hymnal, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, hymn number 379.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, it's a trust issue, really. When you see a person in a blue uniform with a badge on their chest, you trust that that person is going to serve you and protect you, right? When you see a person in a brownish canvas coat and pants and big giant boots and this funny hard hat that has kind of a a platypus back on the helmet, you trust that that person is going to try to protect you from fire, and if you have fire, they're going to put that fire out, right? If you see a person in a white, long coat, you trust that that person is a health professional and that they're going to try to keep you healthy and heal you when you get, when you get sick, right? You see, it all boils down to trust. And we trust those people because they have a certain street cred, a certain credibility because they've gone to school or they studied their area of expertise and they've proved themselves to be trustworthy on the whole. So a Jesus that miraculously transforms a couple of fish and individual loaves of bread enough to feed the hungry stomachs of thousands, I can trust that. A Jesus who walks on water, I can trust that. A Jesus who victoriously rises from death, conquering death, and then blazes a path to heaven, I can definitely trust that guy. A Jesus who has raised the dead. A Jesus who has transformed simple water into wine. I can trust that. A Jesus who shows mercy. Mercy to people who don't deserve it. I can trust that too. But a sleeping Jesus? Can I trust a sleeping Jesus? If I'm in the boat with the disciples, and the violent wind comes ripping off the Golan Heights, and the sky starts getting ever more darker and darker and darker, and the the wind is blowing harder and harder and harder, and the waves are getting more and more violent, and water is starting to come into the boat, and then I look around, and I see that all the boats that embarked with us out onto the Sea of Galilee, now none of them are around, and we're the only ones out here, And Jesus is in my boat, but he's sleeping. Well, what am I to think? What conclusion am I supposed to come to here? You see, I can trust a Jesus who is standing at the helm of this little craft, and he's barking orders to engage in emergency nautical procedures. I can trust a Jesus who's raising his voice to heaven and he's commanding his angels to to reroute the winds. I can trust that. But he's sleeping. Lord, don't you care? I demand of him. And he awakens. He awakens and he has a seeming disinterest in these howling waves and the ferocious wind and the water that's starting to come into the boat. And I scan this impending doom that's about to be upon us, this crisis situation that we're in, thinking that this is probably how I'm going to go out of this world. Blub, 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 blub. This is my last moments on the face of the earth. And the seconds slow down into a slow motion movie special effect almost. And I look around and in these seconds it gives my brain just enough time to wander down this ever dangerous path of thought and consider the question, can I trust a sleeping Jesus? In this crisis situation that the disciples were facing, they came to their newly acquired Lord. They had not been with him that long. They came to him not in prayer, not in supplication, 
not with a respectful request for assistance, but they came to him with an indictment. Lord, don't you care if we drown? You can almost hear their thoughts bubbling up like cartoon balloons off their head. Oh, Jesus, here we are, almost drowned. We're working our tails off up here, trying to bail this boat out and keep it afloat while you're taking a nap in the back. We could use a little help here. If it wouldn't interfere with your nap, nappy time can wait, maybe, sort of. Could you give us a little assistance? Because your reaction is pretty much telling us you really don't care about us after all. How about a little help, Jesus? Thank you, please. Well, at least that's what I would probably be thinking. The storms of life come to you. And sometimes they threaten, and sometimes they simply blow over. But sometimes the clouds roll in, and they open up, and it starts to rain, and then it pours, and then the wind picks up, and the waves get violent, and then the life of your boat starts to rock and lurch. And within no time, there's water on your deck and it's starting to submerge this little boat and quickly thereafter, things are quickly going downhill. They're quickly going from bad to worse. It all boils down to trust, doesn't it? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. But it's what we do see that causes the fear and the anxiety in our heart, isn't it? Storms blow in, waves of crises wash over us, and we're almost drowned, you and I immediately kick into what? Survival mode. Just like the sailors on Paul's storm-battered boat, we pass ropes under our ship in order to hold it together. And what are those ropes that we use? Ropes manufactured from our wisdom. Ropes manufactured from our thoughts. Ropes manufactured from how I think that I should solve this crisis solution that I'm in. Think back to that last disaster in your life. How well did that work for you? Where does, where does the, the ropes of our manufacture get us? Failure to trust in the promises of your Savior result only in more fear and in more torment. And if you stay there, all you accomplish is more fear and more torment. Our reaction to these situations, just like the disciples, we're slow to learn, and we fear, and we worry, and we panic, and we place an indictment before our Lord. Lord, don't you care? And as those words come out of my mouth, and they hang in the wind for a few seconds, then they get drowned by the waves. My eyes scan the situation that I find myself in, and the seconds seem to slow down into a, a movie special effect. And it gives my old thick skull and the brain matter that's in there just enough time to wander down this most dangerous train of thought and consider the question, can I really trust a sleeping Jesus? Folks, if there was ever a question in the history of this world that need never be asked, this is it. 
We who know the rest of the story, because we are frail human flesh, all we need to do is be reminded to have our eyes redirected to that cross of Calvary and to be reminded of those Jesus nail prints, both on his wrists and his, on his feet, and then to gaze at the glorious emptiness, the glorious nothingness of the tomb in which he was laid. Victory. Victory for him and victory, victory for those who follow. So from the very same voice that created wind and wave, a word of rebuke comes to the storm. Quiet, be still. And the, the wind, it changes from foe to friend. And the furious, the furious and infuriated waters are angry no more. And the men stop shouting, his disciples stop shouting, and there is calm. And the only response that the disciples can muster is, who is this? In what disaster of your life did you lose your faith like the disciples in this storm? Why did you think that Jesus was asleep? Why would you ever consider that a calamity, the force of nature, the illness, that weather, that even death could gain mutiny control over its creator. Why would you ever consider that? In the words of Jesus himself, why were you so afraid? Or as the original language really says it and how it should really be translated, why were you so cowardly? Do you still have no faith? Jesus puts we, his disciples, or allows us to be in middle of disasters. Not because he's vengeful, not because he's evil or sadistic, and wants to watch us implode under the pressure of fear. But Jesus allows us to be in the middle or puts us in the middle of disaster so that we will rather explode like a firework into the dark sky and show the beauty and the awe that can come out of chaos. He puts us or allows us to be in the center of disaster for a divine purpose to be instruments of his grace that shows his glory to a world that has none. But first, first he put himself in the center of the ultimate disaster, the sin and guilt of sinners. Jesus made your storm his storm. He made himself the target of God's angry lightning bolts against your sin. But by his perfect life, by his innocent death, by the power of his cleansing blood, by the power of his resurrection, he has stilled the storm of sin's punishment for you forever. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what God's Son has done for you. The truth of the matter, folks, is that this life can be a scary, wicked, painful, hurting, wearisome place to spend 70 or 80 years. That's the truth on the dark side. The equal truth on the light side is that if there's anything that Jesus wants you to go home with today, what's the kernel? The kernel of this text is, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In other words, don't go telling God how big your storms are. Tell your storm 
how big your God is. Because it all boils down to trust. Can I really trust a sleeping Jesus? Sleep? My Jesus? Your Jesus? Jesus never sleeps. There's your comfort. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to open up your service folder to the very middle. On page 7, we'll join together in confessing our Christian faith using the ancient creed of the apostles. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we now take the collection of our offering. I invite the congregation to rise for the responsive prayer of the church. It can be found on page number eight of your service folder. Lord over, Lord over all things, our Savior and Redeemer. Hear us as we tell you about the troubles in our lives, the sufferings and hardships we endure. Lord over all things, our Savior and Redeemer, I know that I not only sufferings in this life, but that I cause suffering. I know that I not only experience evil, but I think, say, and do evil things. And in my sin, I doubt that you care about my sufferings. Hear us as we tell you about our sins.
Lord of all, over all things, our Savior and Redeemer, when the disciples were suffering, you calmed the storm. When we needed forgiveness, you died on the cross. And now when we need comfort, you give us your word to speak to us. Hear us as we say thank you for all these things. Lord over all things, our Savior and Redeemer, strengthen our trust in you as our Savior from sins. Strengthen our desire to look to your word for comfort in our sufferings and strengthen our desire to share you, our God who cares, with our friends, family, and neighbors. And triune God, as Ernie and Helen Czar celebrate their 59th wedding anniversary, Accept our heartfelt thanks for all the blessings that they have received from you. As companions on the journey through life, they have loved, consoled, and they have supported each other. But most important, they have grown closer to you. By your grace, they have maintained a Christian home and raised their children in the trusting, training, and instruction of the Lord. They have learned forgiveness and unconditional love from you. Your word has been a lamp to their feet and a light for their path. Keep them committed to each other and to you. Continue to supply their earthly needs according to your will and give them joys in the years to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord of all nations, as we celebrate the gifts that you've given to us here in Canada, we praise you for the blessings you have showered on our country. Guide and guard our representatives in government as they care for the needs of all citizens. Give them wisdom to rule our society with honesty and justice, that we may have peace in our lives and opportunities to witness to your love. In your name, we bring all these things before our God, who can do all things. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we join together in singing our next hymn, from the red hymnal number 421.
I invite the congregation to rise for closing prayers. Almighty God, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for teaching us the things that you want us to believe and to do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. All this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve your great God with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his eternal peace. Let's remain standing for the singing of our closing hymn. You may be seated for just a moment. Good morning again. Welcome to all of you, especially to our visitors who are with us. Please take a moment to introduce yourself on the way out. We're very happy that you're here. Uh, just one, two pieces of business. Number one, there is a voters meeting this afternoon. We will feed you, so please stick around. But that meeting will begin at 1 p.m. in the fellowship hall downstairs in case you need to shuttle someone home and grab a quick sandwich in between. Please do come back. The second thing that you should be aware of is that this is Pastor Halderson's last day serving as pastor of Divine Word in Nepean. He accepted a call to serve a, a little congregation called Grace in Scroggins, Texas, a while back. 
That is in the northeast corner. Um, pretty much kind of like here, I guess. A lot of green and it's not deserty and there's no cacti. Uh, but he will de be departing um, in the next couple of weeks and take up his duties there. The vacancy call has been extended to me to serve as their vacancy pastor. And hearing the voice of our Savior in that call to serve those saints, I've accepted that call. So what that's going to mean for the foreseeable future is that I will be covering all of their business meetings. And, take, and if we end up bringing our shepherd into this, we're kind of waiting on a call from them. But what's that going to mean for you is that I will be preaching and teaching Bible class over there next Sunday. Pastor Thompson will be here. And we will just be flip-flopping Sundays back and forth like that until the Lord of the church supplies a called worker to serve as pastor of the flock at Divine Word. So... With that, we pray for your blessings on that decision and that service to our brothers and sisters over at Divine Word. And I humbly ask for your prayers for strength, for energy, for zeal, and for wisdom. So with that, have a blessed week in Christ. Men, don't forget, voters meeting at 1 o'clock, and I'll greet all of you in the back of church. Have a blessed day.